Okay, so the um, so far we have now covered all of the kind of more sophisticated tools that we can implement inside Insight Maker and Vinsim. So from here on out, we're now looking at ways to start building more complex models using all of the things we learned about that Vinsim and Insight Maker can do. And so we're gonna start kind of slow um, with some simple models uh, here in this unit. And then the next unit, we'll see kind of case studies of more complex models. And these should help serve as examples of the types of structures that you might build in your final project. All right, and so this is kind of very topical, kind of epidemic dynamics. And so we've, you know, been through a, uh, or in a pandemic. And, and so, you know, some of these models that, um, that we've seen here are actually, you know, you know, taken kind of from the news and things like that. So they're sort of, um, you know, motivated by uh, real life. And so um, back in 2020, uh, this is an NPR article um, that um, was referencing a Nature Communications article that was about uh, how these computer simulation tools were being rapidly used. Of course, they were always used in epidemics, but it just gained a kind of a focus to better understand how does these spread through populations and how um, and to do scenario planning or strategic analysis of the different ways you might be able to intervene. So, um, and so this is uh, kind of, you know, again, sort of motivation for this. And, you know, if we don't think necessarily about COVID, but about any epidemic, if you look at like this is for in 2014, the Ebola epidemic in Africa, uh, then if we look at different areas of Africa and we look at all the total here in Africa, um, we've got um, this infection peak that um, that kind of, although the, the, the height and the width are a little bit different, the rough, the shape looks very similar uh, regardless of where you go. So we would like to have a model that can help us explain where the shape comes from and what the differences are, like why in Guinea here, it's very, it doesn't get very high, but it's very wide. Whereas in Liberia here, it's very tall, but not quite so wide. So, you know, where do those things come from? That's what we want to do is to try to build models that can replicate these types of curves and then allow us to play with the parameters of those models so we can better understand that if those models are a representation of what's going on in reality, then adjusting the parameters gives us a roadmap for what we might try to do in the real world to move from you know the this green one to this red one, if, if that seems like that makes sense to do. So how do we get there? One of the simplest epidemic models is so-called SIR model, which I'm sure you've heard about in like SOS 101. Um, and it's a um, it has three major dynamic variables here: a group of susceptible people, a group of infectious people, and a group of recovered people. And so you take a population and you tessellate it or partition it. Um, into three parts. And so the whole population is the sum of these three parts. And then the question is, how does the population trade um, from one group to the other? This particular type of model is what we call a compartmental model or a multi-compartment model. And so models in which you start out by thinking about a large population and breaking them into parts and then seeing how you go from one part to the other go under this name, compartmental model. So as we start noticing commonalities across the models, it sort of gives you these motifs, almost like these archetypes again, that you can start thinking about using in your final projects. Like, oh, I can divide my population up between people who you know, like the iPhone or like an Android phone or something like that. So um, you can start thinking about the same types of techniques here. And, um, and we'll see a lot of similarities when we look at the bath model, I think next uh, week. Um, and so it's another example of, um, of how uh, ideas for one application area um, end up being very transferable and generalizable to another. So we have three stocks that are the three different portions of the uh, population. Now stocks don't change on their own. Uh, stocks uh, need flows to make them change. So not only do we have to define stocks, so we drop those off there, but whenever you put the stocks in there, you have to think, how am I actually gonna get these stocks to change? And that introduces another set of variables and those are your flows. So not only do I have to keep track of how many are in each one of these three groups, but in the instant of time, I have to know the rate of change um, of, you know, in and out of these groups, or in this case, the rate of change from susceptible to infectious, the rate of change 
from infectious to recovered, and that's covered by infections or this rate of change, and recoveries will be this rate of change. So I can put all those together, <clears throat> and I get this relatively simple model. Um, I borrowed this model from a text that I uh, used, because um, I like the graphics there, that used the term infected population. Technically, uh, when we talk about the SIR model, we're supposed to use infectious, because it's true that they are infected, but the salient feature of an SIR model is not just that they're infected, but they're spreading the infection. So we use the term infectious, but for the rest of this um, presentation, you can think of infected and infectious as synonyms, because you know, I borrowed some of the graphics down here because I thought they were helpful. All right, so um, <clears throat> you know, the, we say, well, now that we have this structure, we have to come up with the formulas for the two flows. And that's kind of the, the part that we have the ability to do, but this is like, you know, we're at the point in the semester where we're in formula building mode, where we have to kind of like exercise on how to build these things up. And we've seen several examples of these, and like we'll see, like recoveries is gonna look very similar to an example we've seen before. So we can zoom in on recoveries, and <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we model the transition of somebody who's infected to somebody who's recovered. And, um, and that, if you think about it, is really the only thing that matters there is waiting. Like, um, you know, without modeling other interventions like the ability to put, you know, treatments and those like things like that in there, all we really have here is the, the average time it takes for someone to go from infected to recovered. We're not modeling a disease that has death. We'll talk about how you could add that in there later. We're saying in this case, for this particular type of disease, there's negligible death. So <clears throat> we're just modeling for this simple kind of canonical disease, uh, how long it takes to go from here to there. And that doesn't really depend on anything except for this parameter, which is the average time it takes to become well again, to become recovered. So um, if you think about it, this is identical to what we did with bacteria dying. Um, we said, what's the average amount of time bacteria live? And that's kind of like um, the average time they stay in the alive compartment before they move into the dead compartment. So you can think of this as the bacteria alive, bacteria dead, or you can think of this as the infectious, and this is the recovered. And so when we did it with bacteria, if we knew the average lifetime, the formula for this death's flow was just the number of bacteria divided by the average lifetime. And that's what we're gonna end up getting here. Because we're saying the number of recoveries is just <clears throat> every person in the infected population contributes one recovery after an average of duration of infection. So each individual person is described by this thing over here. So each individual person will eventually become recovered on average this amount of time. And then if we think about how many people are moving from infected to recovered, we just need to multiply this rate by the total number of people. And that's where we get this recoveries. So are there questions about this, this formula here? This one I meant to bring up the other screen. I'll just let that sit, everyone to kind of stew about it there as I open up the other questions poll. Okay, <clears throat> so I can simple So this is just the number of recoveries per day. I can simplify that by saying infected population divided by duration of infection. And when I write it like this, I hope you see that this magical term time constant kind of pops out there or mean lifetime, like we were talking about last time, is that we were saying that <clears throat> when we have these types of processes, like um, the uh, nutrients entering the bloodstream or the food, um, you know, as the food exits the stomach and things like that, we've got kind of this, um, ultimately we know that the infected population is sort of trying to be driven to zero by this recoveries process. And so you can kind of think of this in the toilet tank model, as the target uh, is zero, and this is kind of the, the current water level. So uh, we want to bring the water level down to zero. So you can kind of think of this as kind of the gap. And so we've got the gap divided by the average time it takes for a unit of the gap to get eliminated. 
<clears throat> and that's exactly what we have here. And so duration of infection, we can call time constant or mean lifetime. It's the average time somebody who is infected stays infected. And so this is a common formula that you're gonna use whenever you have this sort of transition. Okay, any questions about that? You see the connections between the bacteria? Okay. All right, so <clears throat> in order for us to implement this formula, inside VinSim or Insight Maker, uh, we have to uh, start drawing these links. And so um, I have to introduce a duration of infection exogenous variable. So that's set from outside. So if I did wanna say, what would happen if we came up with a drug that would greatly reduce uh, the infections rather than modeling the innovation process of coming up with the drugs inside the model, I would just leave the model as is, but then I would go in and change the duration of infection to a lower level and <clears throat> see how it changed the spread. So that's what I mean by it's an exogenous variable. I have to introduce that. And then I also have to connect infected population up to recoveries. And that those two connections allow me to drill down into recoveries and put in this equation. Okay. So that's the back half of the SIR model, the kind of easier half. So before we go on to the kind of harder half of the SIR model, are there any questions about that? <clears throat> Okay, so that's great. Now, if I'm thinking about my final project, I might have certain outputs that I wanna capture to run stats on. And maybe just capturing the number of infected, the number of recovered is enough. But it might be useful for me to have certain other variables that are kind of derived from these. And so one thing I can do is to create this variable, which does not play, uh, currently does not play a role in the dynamics called affected population, where I just bring recovered into it, infected into it, and I make that the sum. And then that makes it convenient because if I wanna plot the number of people affected by this disease over time, as opposed to the number who are infected right now or recovered right now, I can now plot affected population and right inside VinSim, it'll kind of show me the history of how many people were affected by it. So that's why that might be a useful um, sort of side variable to have there. Now it's, but still, it looks a little confusing. Like it looks like there might be some other loops or something going on here. So I might wanna take this thing since it's just for me running the sim and move it somewhere else. And that's where those ghost variables, ghost primitives and shadow variables can become useful because I can create elsewhere in my canvas, a copy of infected population, elsewhere in the canvas, a copy of recovered population, connect them to affected population. And then this little triplet, I can just like put way down in the bottom somewhere, hidden away so that it doesn't kind of confuse the look of the main SIR model. So that's one of the nice things we can do with shadow variables to kind of clean up the diagrams. That's one thing that we can do. So now we wanna move on to um, this infections formula here, which is gonna be a little bit more complex. So we have to think about, we have to make hypotheses about what drives infections in this population. And so this is one um, dynamic hypothesis for what I drive infections. And, um, and so in this case, this was uh, drawn, I think in Stella actually by uh, Ford in his textbook. And so you can see that they, um, in Stella, they've actually got this nice little summing node where you can create a little bubble um, where inside of it, you can say, I want you to add up a bunch of variables. And so it can add up infected and recovered and it doesn't even need to have lines or anything. So it's really compact. You just put it over on the side and that's how Stella does it. So some of these tools have got some extra fancy stuff in there, but we're just focusing on this kind of rectangle over here um, where we've got the susceptibles, infected infections per day. And they've added in a bunch of exogenous variables that seem to be important. Like we've got the number of contacts per day per infected person. So we know that these infected people uh, or infectious people are getting up and going around um, and bumping into other people. And every time they bump into someone else, they might infect them. So we could go out and actually for everyone who's infected, take stats on how, you know, how many people they bump into, and we could fill in a context per day per infected person and drop it in there. And, um, and then that will help us figure out how many contacts 
um, are made that are potentially infectious. And then for every contact, we can keep track of how often do contacts actually with infected people actually end up in another infection. And so that becomes like a probability here. So that's what we're gonna walk through here is that we can see that the total contacts per day that are potentially infectious are going to be how many contacts each individual person has times how many infected people are out there. So that's how we form this. It's kind of similar to the bacteria case, but instead of dividing by a mean lifetime, we're multiplying by a rate. So this is the rate per individual. This is the number of individuals so this is the number of potentially infectious contacts in the whole population per day. So many questions about this formula here, where that comes from. We just created a exogenous variable that we claim that we can go out and measure somehow. And then we said, well, that's per person. So we need to scale it up by the number of people. And that gives us the number of potentially infectious contacts during the day. They aren't necessarily infectious, but those are contacts that the next question will be how many of them actually lead to a, a disease. Yep. That's a, a good question. So that will end up being something that's going to come into play um, shortly. We're going to find that that although this was a good first step, this is going to be a limited model and that that's going to be a big part of it. So the question was, this context per day per infected person, what type of people are the infected people interacting with? I think if I'm... I'm yes. Yeah, this would be, this would be the, um, the way this is written. It's if you're infected, we assume that all infected people are roughly the same. And that's you know, also an approximation, which we could embellish and, and get rid of. But in this one, we're assuming all infected people are you know, all, all about the same. And every infected person interacts with other people. And we don't know if they're infected or not. We're just saying that if you've got the cold or whatever this is, then uh, everybody who's got the cold um, is going to bump in to five people uh, every day on average. Those five people might be infected, people might not be. And so one of the things we're gonna have to fix in this model is that is to deal with the fact that when you bump into another infected person, there's actually no transmission. It's only the bumping into susceptibles that create the transmission, but we're not there yet. So that will be a flaw in this model. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions about this basic model that we're building up? Questions online? Okay. All right, so simple formula there. Um, now, once we've got each one of these contacts, not all of them will end up actually leading to a transmission. You can bump into somebody who's sick and not get sick yourself. And so there's going to be some probability of each contact leading to um, a actual infection. So we need uh, an infectivity parameter, which is going to be a parameter between zero and one. It's just going to be a probability. And so if it's a really um, infectious disease, then every contact is going to relate or is going to lead to a transmission. And that would be 100%, it would be a one. If um, it's not very infectious, and so every contact only like, you know, 1% of the people get it, then this would be like a 0.01. And so we can kind of say, so whereas this we measured by looking at every infected person, here we're going to look at every interaction that we've monitored between an infected person and a person who's not infected, be like contact tracing. And through the contact tracing records, we can sort of figure out what the infectivity is of this disease. And then we can plug it into the model there. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, yeah, so the, the actual diagram, regardless of multiplying or divide, is going to look the same. Aside, I mean, if you add causal links, the polarities might change, or like if you annotate these with causation, the polarities might change, but, um, but uh, this just gives you kind of access to it. So I think the question is that like, if I know that contacts per day matters and infectivity matters, how do I know that I'm multiplying or dividing here? And um, some of that you get, you, the units will hint at that. 
not for this one, sadly, but a lot of times, if you know the unit for infections per day, um, if there's only one way to do that with these two variables, and that might be to multiply it. Now, unfortunately here, infectivity, because it's a percentage, is unitless. And so this context per day is already in the right units here. So we don't know if this is dividing or multiplying. So in that case, um, you know, formally, sometimes it takes a little bit of, uh, of domain knowledge or a little math knowledge. And so I can think about like infections per day. Um, I, if, if I know a little bit of probability, then I know that there's this thing called Bayes rule, which allows me to break things up into products. And that's kind of the advantage of knowing a little bit of math is that it actually helps you structure these things. And I know that in order for me to know infections per day, um, I, I'm going to need some sort of conditional probability, which would be like, given that I've had a contact, um, given I've had a contact, what's the probability that leads an infection? Well, that is what an infectivity is. And I know by this thing called Bayes rule that if I multiply that by the probability of getting a contact, then I end up getting a probability of having an infection. So, um, so some of the, like, at, 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 for real sophisticated things, you actually need to kind of go and maybe actually do a little bit of, you know, like, you know, you not only have to know a little bit about simulation, you have to a little bit to know about mathematical modeling. For these things, there will just be patterns that um, we're going to get used to. So. It's going to be like this pattern we're going to see again next week, but not for disease spread, but for um, a marketing example. And in that case, there will also be a scalar, which you're going to have the number of things that happen, um, the number of things that could happen, the number of things that actually happen, and then the, the factor that represents them. So um, it's you just kind of get used to um, that that there's going to be certain patterns here and like in the fact of infectivity like i could technically divide it and just name this something else because it's just a parameter so if i don't like infectivity i could come up with a different name for whatever the reciprocal is this thing is and then that would end up being the dividing so there's a little bit of freedom and flexibility but um in a lot of this is just going to kind of come with practice so for now i just want to show you enough of these models that you start sort of forming a conceptual model with it because um, it's kind of outside of the scope of the class for me to kind of go into like writing this out probabilistically. But when I build models professionally, I usually have to actually start out. Uh, I use a lot of probability. And so I have to say like, what's the probability of X? Well, the probability of X, it can be broken down into the probability of X win Y times the probability of Y. The probability of y is something I can look up in a table. And so, you know, and so once you kind of have that ability, it makes it much easier to write these things. But for now, it, you almost sort of have to, um, it's, it's based on intuition, I guess. I know that's not very satisfying, but hopefully the formulas that we see here will be straightforward enough that intuition will be enough to carry you through. All right, so any other questions? All right, so. So that, that's how we got total contacts per day. It was just um, that infections, uh, so infections per day is just total contact per day times the infectivity. Then um, if we put both of those together, then we've got the blue one, total contacts per day, that was uh, infected uh, population times the contacts per day per person. The orange one is the infections per day, that's total contacts per day times the infectivity. So we got those two that are already built there. Um, and now we can sort of say, well, now that we have those built, then do we see the nature of this feedback loop? And if we look at an infected population goes to total contacts per day. Well, if we go down here, infected population has a positive relationship with total contacts per day. As you increase this one, you increase that one. Total contacts per day goes up to infections per day. Well, down here, total contacts per day has a positive relationship with infections per day. And there's always an implicit positive relationship this way. So what I've got here is now a reinforcing feedback loop. So I didn't know that was there. Um, I built the equations up. And then after I built the equations, I did the analysis and I've got a reinforcing feedback loop. And does that make conceptual sense to me? Well, I think it does because what it's kind of saying is when there's only one infected person, this, um, this engine is gonna be slow 
But then as you get more infected people, there's more opportunities for infection. And so this grows. So that kind of makes sense that this is a growth of the number of infected population. So, um, so yeah, so before I get to go on, are there any questions about that? We're gonna leave that up there. Does this make sense so far? We, we kind of defined these formulas and then we could analyze them to find the feedback loops. And the feedback loops kind of gave us an insight about the dynamics, which helped us sort of validate or build up confidence in our model. Okay. All right, so um, if I put that with the previous thing together, I've got our recovery process, which we modeled at uh, the start of the lecture. This is a contagion process, which is this uh, uh, reinforcing loop. So reinforcing times balancing. So now I've got a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop. So what does that make you think when you see a reinforcing loop next to a balancing loop? Yeah, as shaped curve, right. So that's another thing I want you to start, start building up is, is that now those system archetypes that we talked about before the midterm, we can start seeing them popping out. You know, we didn't plan to put them there. We just put formulas down. And it turned out that, um, you know, after we got these formulas here, then, um, then we naturally got a reinforcing time of balancing. It helps us predict what might happen here. It's a little confusing though, because there's, there's a lot of other stocks in here. And so um, this is not necessarily a guarantee that we're gonna see the S-shaped growth like we think it's gonna be there. Um, and like, you know, with, I'm gonna advance to the next slide here and I'm gonna see what happens when we simulate this thing after we plug in values for these things. Um, and, and we have to be careful that we don't get too carried away. Um, like this S-shaped growth prediction, to me, that should actually mean that, well, you know, what's growing? Well, the infected population's growing. So I would expect an S-shaped growth in the infected population where it grows and grows and grows and then eventually is limited by this balancing loop. If I don't see that, and I, but I do see other S-shaped growths, then that um, I shouldn't let the other S-shaped growths distract me and think that I did a good job because if, if the infected population doesn't do the S-shaped growth, then maybe there's more going on here or maybe I didn't do something right or maybe that's something that I need to further investigate. So let's see um, how this is gonna turn out. So I wanna go simulate this. So I'm going to put in, I'm gonna say that every infected person has six contacts per day um, I'm going to say that every time you get an interaction, there's a 25% uh, chance that it will lead to an infection. And I'm going to say that the infection lasts on average for two days. So something kind of cold-like, I guess. Um, then I need to set up initial conditions. And so I'm going to have a population of 10,000. And to get the ball rolling, I'm going to um, sort of inoculate the population with two infected people. And so 900, the rest of the 10,000 are susceptible, no recovered at first. And then I let this thing rip. And then I get something that looks like this. And at first I get excited because I see a shape grow. But then I get a little confused because I look at this and I say, well, this, this is s shaped growth in the recovered population, but I don't remember a growth in a limitation process related to recovery. And I see this, um, a couple other weird things here, like this infection peak, which is this curve two, this is the infected population. It like shoots up and then has a huge point and then plummets down. Um, and I'm expecting things to be smoother, like to kind of ramp up and then roll over and not like this sharp turn here. So it looks like it's kind of close, but there's nothing that's not quite right. And then it's also weird that this susceptible population just crashes and then hits the floor and then just holds at zero. Like that doesn't look natural. It's rare for natural processes to just, um, you know, accelerate into the floor. Uh, like usually you think the floor would push back a little bit on that. So it kind of gives me a hint that maybe I need to look back um, at uh, my model to make sure that there's not something else going on. And sure enough, if I look back at, and I did this in Insight Maker, um, <clears throat> if I look at Insight Maker in the susceptible population stock, um, there's a checkbox, it'll be on the right hand side of it, that by default says restrict this stock to positive values. And 
that I left checked on by accident. And I've mentioned this before, um, the, a lot of simulation tools default to this on, but I don't know why, because anybody who uses simulation hates this option because it hides things that like, I'm trying to model a process that I thought that I understood through all those equations. And this effectively introduces an equation that I didn't write. So I don't, I, so I want to uncheck that. The reason it being checked, what happened there is this susceptible population hit zero and it would have gone negative, you know, but uh, it hit zero and then held zero because it was artificially forced there. That's the reason why this infected population suddenly um, went, it was growing and then suddenly fell here. If it, if I would have left this unchecked, this susceptible population would have gone down into the ground and this infected population would have effectively kept going. So it would be weird because I'd be getting like negative susceptible people that would be fueling the growth in the infected population. So this all over like around just shows me there's something must be wrong with my logic. I, I must be leaving something out because this Although these dynamics look kind of right, they are not being driven by the processes that I thought were gonna be driving them. So I need to go back and look for these fundamental problems. And some of this has already been brought up. So if we look at this thing here, the, the major problem that we have is that the number of infections per day only depends upon the number of infected. It does not depend upon the number of susceptibles, at least not in the equations that we wrote. So this means that even though there could be zero susceptible population, the model as we build it is gonna try to suck infections out of that. So it's like, you know, trying to get blood from a stone here, but the, the sim is gonna let it get blood from a stone um, unless it had that little checkbox uh, checked here. But if I wanna model what actually happens in reality, I should make the number of infections per day depend upon not only the number who are currently infected, but also the number of susceptibles that are available to get infected. And as I get fewer and fewer susceptibles, it sh I should see less and less infections because that's really what happens in real disease spread. So I need to model that. So that's kind of what I'm saying here is that infections per day and total contacts per day currently do not depend upon the susceptible population. And that's a major fundamental problem with this model. So we need to revisit these equations so they do uh, depend on that. So any questions about that? Anybody following me here that, that there's something missing in these that we need to fill in? You can't, you can't. Right, and that's the problem is that this bot, if I were to uncheck that box and say, Insight Maker, you can let that go negative. It will then um, let it go negative and it will become negative. And I know that in the real world, I can't have negative susceptibles, but the dynamics I built will create negative susceptibles, which tell me that my dynamics are wrong. So that's what I'm saying there is that you're absolutely right. You cannot have negative susceptible population. That's right. So when when there's a massive difference here, I mean that massive difference is is in my simulated world, you can have negative susceptibles, which doesn't make any sense. In the real world, you can never have negative susceptibles. So that means there's something wrong in my simulated world. My simulated world is not a good proxy for the real world, and I need to fix my simulated world. Fair question. That's right. This, this flows equation and some of these auxiliary variables need to depend not only on the infected population, but also on the susceptible. Yeah. That's right. The susceptible population is, yeah, it's, it's right now it's being modeled as like an infinite pool of susceptibles and that's not realistic. So how do we fix that? So yeah, so we wanna, this is what I wanna fix this sharp peak. And I wanna make it so that um, that I don't need right now insight makers like catching my air and trying to fix it for me, but I don't want insight maker to fix my air. I just need my equations to be right to begin with. And so that's what I'm going back and trying to fix. So how do we do that? Um, yeah. And also it's like unrealistic that my recovered population is going to be exactly, 
um, my uh, my total population, and unrealistic that um, there's this is saying that no susceptibles will ever escape this. And we know that in real um, uh, diseases, real disease spreads, you actually do get susceptible populations that can manage to escape it. And so we're not capturing what goes on in the real world. So that's what we're sort of saying here. So how do we fix it? Um, well, I would, I've, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, so at the end of this lecture, I can talk about um, how you can create a multi-compartment model that includes those who are infected but not symptomatic like we can add those things in but in this in this simple model this is a simple disease where you either don't have it you have it and you're spreading it um or you recovered from it and there's no question of like how conspicuous uh your disease is it's just are you spreading it or not and it doesn't really matter as to whether or not you're showing symptoms yeah so i'm going to get rid of this model and make some slight changes. And so we're leaving the recoveries alone. This half is the same, it's fine. But over here, um, infections, if we go out here, this blue stuff is all the stuff we've changed. So we have total contacts per day and contacts per day per infected person. Um, so we still have the infected population um, interacts with a certain number of people in the population. And we know that we can say this, we just see that, that when, when Jim or Dill or whoever is sick and we watch how much they, they bump into about six people per day. So if we multiply by the number, this is how many they uh, that are, how many contacts are happening over the whole population. Now, not all of those are dangerous. Some of those contacts are going to be with other infected and that's not dangerous. So infected people bump into infected people. And if we assume that infection just leads to recovery anyway, they're not gonna double get the disease. So we need to sort of exclude those from our infections flow. So that's what we're gonna do here. And I'm gonna drill down into each one of these, but this is an overview. Um, what we're basically doing is we're saying, we're gonna calculate the fraction of contacts that are with susceptible people. And that's gonna be based on how many are currently susceptible in the whole population. So if the whole population currently has 10% susceptibles, then we're gonna say that 10% of the total contacts are dangerous contacts. And so as you get fewer susceptibles in the population, then you're going to get a smaller number of dangerous contacts, which will mean a smaller infections flow. So as the susceptibles goes to zero, so will the infection flow. And that will prevent susceptibles from even being tempted into the negatives. And that will naturally uh, uh, cause the infected population to peak and then come down. So, um, so we'll see that here in a second. Well, I mean, that's, that's, um, I mean, that's sort of semantics, which don't matter to this model, because um, all we're saying is that the, a dangerous contact is a contact between an infected person and a susceptible. If a contact is with a recovered person, it's not dangerous. If a contact with an infected person, it's not dangerous. Well, the well, all that is bundled into infectivity. So we're building an average model of a susceptible person. And we're saying that when a susceptible person bumps into an infected person, then there may be, um, you know, it, this probability of infectivity, there could be some people who are more likely to get it than others. There could be some people that are less likely to get it than others. But on average, across the whole population, if you give me 10 susceptible people um, and each one of them bumps into an infected person, then 20% of that population is going to end up being infected afterwards. And that's what we're modeling here. We certainly can create more compartments. We could say we have very susceptibles and we have not quite so susceptibles and whatever. And we would have to make sure that all of those compartments added up to our total population. 
And we could do that, but it just makes the math a little more complex. And so right now we're saying, let's see how much mileage we can get out of a disease by assuming it's these three compartments. Compare that to the real world data. If it is um, matches the infection peaks we see in the real world, then it becomes a tool for us to experiment with to prototype ideas for the real world. It may be that these three models are never going to get the, thing, the Ebola, in which case we absolutely need to complexify this model to get the Ebola peak. But if we can get the Ebola peak out of these three, then there's no need to add the further complexity, which is just more opportunity for us to screw up a parameter. So we want to reduce the number of parameters because that um, makes it much easier for us to match to the real world if we have less parameters to worry about. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's what I'm about to do right now. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in here on So like it's it's subtle, but um, but yeah, I'll, I'll go down through every one of these equations so that we can we'll re, we'll capture all of this. So yeah, so what we're adding here, so I've got the highlighted here in orange infections, and then dangerous contacts per day in blue, and it's supposed to be blue here, but it's kind of hard to see in the projector. So this little equation, which probably could be a lot bigger, apologize for that. Um, but so the first thing we did is this flow, infections flow, we're going to say infections are going to are going to be uh, due to the dangerous contacts per day times the infectivity. Infectivity, we have the same thing we had before. And now instead of being based on total contacts per day, it's only the number that are dangerous. Now I haven't defined how the heck we're going to define what the, the dangerous contact is, but let's take it on faith that that's, that's our next problem. So we've solved this problem. It just needs to be based on dangerous. Now our next problem is how the heck we define what a dangerous contact is. So that's the next thing we're walking to. So then we move on and we say, okay, so dangerous contacts per day here, that's the problem we're solving now. What's a dangerous contact? Well, we're gonna say it's, um, it's upper bounded by the total contacts per day. So it's a fraction of the total contacts per day. So an infected person bumps into uh, six uh, contacts per day, but only one of them, so maybe a sixth of those, ends up being dangerous contact. Well, so how are we going to model that? Well, this is an, is an approximation. This is an assumption. But we're going to say that uh, we can take total contacts per day and scale it down by the fraction of contacts that are with a susceptible person. So if we can define what the fraction of contacts with a susceptible person are, then that just naturally scales down the total number of contacts. We still have to, again, that, this will be our next challenge is how do we define that? So we're keep pushing this through, this bubble through. So then where do we get this fraction thing? Well, this is um, a commonly used assumption when we do these types of, um, these mean field models, these system of analysis models, a well mixedness assumption. And so we are assuming, and if we need to violate this assumption, we can add more compartments and things. But for this simple model, we're assuming that everyone in the population is sort of equally likely to bump in to anyone else in the population. So it, we're, a violation of this would be like all the susceptibles live together, all the infectious live together, and all the recovered live together, and they only interact on the boundary. That would be a violation of well mixedness. So we're basically saying that if you bump into anybody, the probability that they are a susceptible infectious or recovered will match their proportion in the population. So it's like if uh, 50, if say 55% of the world is female and you happen to bump into somebody, then we're saying there's a 55% chance that it is a female. Now, if all the females hang out together and all the males hang out together, then and if you're a man, then you bump into somebody else, they're probably men. If you're a woman and you bump into somebody else, they're probably a woman. But if they're well mixed, so they're kind of integrated, then it's the fraction of the total population is the probability that that contact's going to be that way. So that's what we're assuming here. If you add quarantine policy and things like that, that will violate this. And, um, and we may need to then do things like change the total contacts per day and things like that, that would be a way to back that into this. But for now, we're just assuming that everybody's out mingling and there's a, and this is the well mix in this approach. And that gives us the ability to just say that the fraction of contacts with a susceptible person are simply the fraction of the population that is susceptible. And that fraction that's susceptible is just gonna be 
the number that are in the susceptible box divided by the sum of all the boxes, or the number in the, in the susceptible box divided by um, this total population variable, which if I were to drill down inside of that, would just be the sum of these three boxes. And so that's how we get all of those expressions, and that's just total population to sum of those three boxes. And so this together, these are all of our new equations that represent what's going on here. So we now can look for the new feedback loops that we've introduced. Before we do that, are there questions about these new expressions that are a more sophisticated and hopefully more realistic way to model infection spread? Okay. All right. So we've got our old expressions over here as well. Um, so we've now got this recovery loop that's over here, our contagion loop, our new contagion loop, and this new depletion loop. And those two things together um, create, so we got our balancing, which is our recovery process, our reinforcing process of contagion, but then look, another balancing process. So now we've got uh, this infect, the growth in the infected population is kind of getting doubly killed by recoveries on one side and by depletion on the other side. So this is like a new motif that I'm not quite sure, um, you know, based on my system archetypes, like what this is going to end up looking like, but um, I still, it'll, it's gonna have some feel of this, my S-shaped growth is gonna help me make sense of this when I simulate it but it's probably not gonna look like S-shaped growth because it's got these like two balancing loops that are killing contagion from both sides. So, um, so let's see that. So I'm kind of expecting an S-shaped decline in susceptibles here and an S-shaped growth in recoveries here. And those two S-shaped growths on the outside will end up kind of um, creating that infection peak that I'm looking for here. So I'm gonna simulate this. So I set up the parameters, set up the initial conditions, and lo and behold, without any funny business from Insight Baker, what I get is a susceptible population that starts at the full population. It declines uh, smoothly. It never hits zero. I got a recovered population, which smoothly rises. And this infection peak, it rises. It starts to grow. It levels off. And then it decays. And so um, that gives me the nice smooth hump that I was expecting coming out of this sort of Ebola infection peaks here. So that's pretty good. Um, and on top of that, the kind of neat thing about it is um, the recovered population never actually hits the asymptote of the full population. What that means is that I've got susceptibles who have escaped the infection entirely because it became so hard to find them um, that, um, that they ended up um, having what we refer to as herd immunity. And so this is where that herd immunity comes from. So now I can actually start asking questions about how do I make this herd larger or smaller? What determines those things and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more useful things I can do with this model. So what determines how outbreaks spread? We're going back to the Ebola thing. How do you get from the, the kind of the, the Guinea population, which was short and flat uh, versus that, um, a Liberia population, which was very tall and thin. Um, so that's kind of the important thing here. So um, this is where, if I look at all these things, I see that I've got three exogenous parameters, infectivity, contacts per day per infected person, and duration of infection. And it turns out that um, this, these three parameters together, if we do a little mathematical analysis of this, form what's called the basic reproduction number, R0 that you might've heard of before, but a lot of times you hear about r not empirically and you don't realize it actually comes as the product of these three endogenous or exogenous parameters. So if you measure infectivity, products per day per infected person and duration of infection, you can calculate r not. So you're not measuring r not, you're measuring these three parameters. And what this also is going to show us is that things like contacts per day per infected person, that's something we can control. So we can actually control the R naught. It's not intrinsic to a disease. If we quarantine people or we recognize that people have diseases, we can control that 
which can reduce this R naught. If we, if we come up with treatments, we can reduce that, which can reduce this R naught. Um, and if we come up with uh, different ways that people interact, we can reduce that, which will reduce this R naught. Now, well, I keep talking about reducing this R naught. Well, what is this R naught for those of us who maybe haven't seen this before? Um, well, if we ask the question, what conditions determine how outbreaks spread? If you think about when an outbreak is starting, when everybody's susceptible except the one or two people that are introduced, then what determines that being the spread or not is a comparison of two rates. You have a single infected person creates a new infection at this rate. It's their contacts per day per infected person times the infectivity. That's how fast they're spreading it. Now, then we also have to ask how quick or how long are they spreaders? Well, that's their duration of infection. So we can think about what's their, their recovery rate. Well, their recovery rate is just one divided by the time constant, their duration of infection. And we can compare these two rates to each other and say, is the rate at which they're infecting people greater than or less than the rate in which uh, they are uh, recovering from the disease? If we do a little bit of uh, algebra, we can then multiply these three things together and compare them all to one. And so we can say, if this thing here is greater than one, it's gonna spread faster than it's gonna be recovered from. If it's less than one, the recovery process will be faster and it'll naturally take care of itself. So um, there's two interpretations of this R naught. You can view it as one, as how frequently someone infects others divided by how frequently they clear their, they clear, how frequently they clear their infection. The alternative way to view it is how long are they infected divided by how long until um, they can infect someone else. They're both kind of the same. Um, and that comes down to this comparing to one or combined together, the standard thing you hear in movies and media or whatever is the average number of new infections caused by each infected individual while they're infectious. So that's what the R naught is. And so if it's greater than one, then every time someone gets the disease, there are going to be, they're gonna recover, but they're gonna leave more than one person uh, infected and that's gonna cause a spread. Alternatively, if it's less than one, then every time somebody gets infected, they're going to infect less than one individuals on average. So it gradually will clear itself out because you go from one infected to only half a person infected. In other words, 50% that somebody's infected. So that's where this R naught comes from. So that's what we're saying here. If it's less than one, it naturally dies out in a population. If it's greater than one, it will spread. And it, then it turns out that that little fraction of herd immunity is just one divided by R naught. So the bigger R naught gets, the smaller the number of susceptibles left over. So if R naught is really close to one, but slightly bigger, then that means that there's gonna be a lot of people will escape. If R naught is gigantic, then hardly anybody's going to escape. And so that's what that one over R. So that's the math um, helps us kind of quantify um, what causes all of these changes in these peaks. And so policymakers now can focus on these three things in order to try to reduce the spread of diseases. And that's what they do. That came from looking at the, the math of it all. And if we go and look up like the Wikipedia page on R naught, this is from 2020. So these are a little bit outdated for some things like COVID, but um, but this gives you an idea that, you know, like measles has got an R naught of 12 to 18. Um, so, you know, if it's spreading, it's, you know, it's gone. Um, you know, there's no, there's no uh, way to get around it, but um, something like the flu, um, it's closer to one, 1 1.4 to 1 1.6. So it's relatively easy to avoid the flu um, just because um, it, uh, the people, somebody with the flu is, going to recover from it quickly. And the flu sucks so much that you're probably stuck at home. So your contact rate probably goes way down anyway. So, uh, so that's R naught. So any questions about uh, how we go from the SIR model to this R naught thing, how it's really just the product of these other things that are easy to measure? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have 
Well, so, so how does that are not it is, it is impacted. R0 is not an intrinsic factor of a disease. Well, well that, that, that's all already built in here. So like mask wearing affects infectivity right here. So if everyone in the population wears masks, then infectivity might be 10%, whereas if they don't wear masks, it might be 90%. So, um, you know, how the, the clothing people wear, how they social distance or whatever, that can affect their infectivity. How often they're out and about affects their contacts per day. And the treatments that are available affect the duration of infection. So, um, so absolutely are not is a emergent property of societies of disease in societies. It is not a fundamental feature of disease. Right, right. So any other questions about, about this? Okay, and R0 also uh, only applies at the beginning of a pandemic. Um, once you're in the middle of a pandemic, there's something called RT, which is actually measuring the real rate of change of it over time. But at the very instant, whether this thing's going to spread or not after you've dropped the first infected person in, that's really, it's whether, the, and, and this is actually directly related to forest fire modeling. You can build a forest fire model that looks exactly like the SIR model. And whether the forest fire spreads or not has to do with the density of the trees. And there is a critical density um, above which um, every tree gets burned and below which only a couple of trees get burned. And those fire regimes, it's just, it's on or off. And it is exactly R0. Um, it's just a density parameter instead of a parameter having the, it's just, the semantics are different, but the math is identical. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you can't write. And, and then I think that, it, it still actually becomes useful. Um, you can predict other dynamical properties if you know what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, the nice thing is anytime throughout the, uh, you can always measure infectivity, conduct for infected person and duration of infection. Those are three things you always can measure. And then if you know those, then you know that if there's a disease somewhere else in some other country, if it were to be introduced here, how quickly it would start spreading. Okay. All right, so uh, I just want to do, um, you know, kind of in light of this, a little scenario example here of how we can use the SIR model with kind of a quarantine modification to show you how we can sort of come up with quarantine policy and things like that. And so, um, you know, again, going back to um, this example that I started out with here, um, we can use these computer models with slight modifications to test out different possible scenarios. And so that's what we're going to kind of try to do here. And this is just highlighting that people are sort of talking about how modeling plays a great role in this sort of scenario planning and thinking things through. Um, it just helps you think about things. So it's not about predicting what's going to happen. It's about thinking about possibilities. So we have a slight modification here to our SIR model. And that's over here in this contact avoidance loop. I think if I go forward, yeah, it'll highlight that. So um, everything is the same, except now, I have this link. Remember, context per day per infected person, that used to be an exogenous variable. I've now added a feedback from infected population to context per day per infected person. And that little squiggle at the bottom of this, this thing here, that is Stella's um, indicator that that's a lookup table. So I'm going to, instead of making this an exogenous variable, I'm going to make it a lookup table, which is going to realize a public policy that's going to say, once we've reached a certain infected population, we are going to implement quarantine that will change the contacts per day. And we're going to see how different triggers for quarantine are going to affect, this, uh, affect the spread. So the way we, uh, we do that is we've got three policies we want to try. Uh, one, which is going to be this. So I'm, I'm modeling the, or um, plotting the behavior over time of the affected population, those who either are currently infected or recovered uh, over time. And one, which is this top line, that's the baseline. So what we're saying here is we're going to have cut in half 
the contact rate at particular triggers. And we either never do it, so it's just, we're just letting it run, or when we hit 2,000 infections, policy kicks in. And this is in a, a population of 10,000 people. So um, you could change the units of this, and it might be like 10,000,000 people, and this would be a trigger at 2,000,000 people. So, you know, it scales. So we're saying basically at uh, whatever this is, 20% of the population, 10% of the population. So do we have the contact rate when we, do we wait for things to get to 20% of the population? Or do we have the contact rate when things only hit 10% of the population? And if I look at these three scenarios and the number of affected, it's actually kind of disappointing. Um, it's sort of saying that, um, that going from, uh, you know, that implementing quarantine at a thousand or at 10% of the population isn't really much different than implementing it at 20% of the population. It really isn't much different than not having quarantine at all. So maybe one of the lessons that I can take from this is that to make any significant impact on the extent, on the spread of an outbreak, you got to catch it early. That's the lesson we get here is that um, that first person that comes off the plane that has that infectious disease, if you don't quarantine them and the very few people that they interact immediately, you might as well give up, at least in terms of number of infected people. You will not reduce the extent of the infection. It's gone. It's out there. Um, and the goal will not be to reduce the affected population because, sorry, you screwed up. 100% of your population will be affected. But all is not lost. If I instead plot the infection peak, then I see a major difference. And um, before COVID, I would give this lecture and this would be really abstract. But I think now this will ring, uh, this will resonate a little bit more. And so, um, so now I'm looking at these three curves. This is baseline. So this is like Liberia. Um, and this down here is a little bit like that, um, the example of the, um, uh, the one that was red and flat um, that I can't think of where it was, but um, for the Ebola examples here, but so we've got a, a tall and not very wide peak. Here's one that I've shortened a little bit. This, this is my um, implement quarantine at 20%, and this is my implement quarantine at 10% of the population. And what I see here is even though the area underneath these three curves is basically the same. So as you make this one taller, it the infection sort of uh, plays out quicker. And so down here, by quarantining, I actually make the sort of like the time that people are affected by this disease last longer. So it seems like I'm extending a pandemic by quarantining. But what I'm seeing that I'm getting by extending it is I'm keeping the peak from getting very high. And this is so-called flattening the curve. And so the idea here is by quarantining, um, we know that after a particular point, very soon in any pandemic, there's no way to prevent um, it from spreading um, and hitting a huge number of the population. It just, it, uh, eventually you can do it, but you gotta do it early. It takes really responsible, um, really proactive, really, you know, planning. And, you know, a lot of governments just aren't into that. Uh, but once things are, are, once the horse has left the gate, um, what you can do is prevent your infrastructure from being um, overloaded. And that's what we see here. So if there is a threshold where you could say, this is how many hospital beds we have, then you could say with no quarantine, something I have not modeled in this SIR model is death due to hospitalization, like the, like the hospital is not having the ability to, to treat these people. And so because I haven't modeled that, then it doesn't look like I'm getting death here. But when I plot it like this, then I say, oh, you know, in a more sophisticated model that did have death, all of these people above this line would probably not be doing so well. And so now in this simple model, I don't have to implement death in the, the, in the kind of aggressive quarantine because we never reach the death threshold. If I um, want to model what actually happens to the population for these, I need to add a death compartment because now I need to actually implement what happens to the mortality rate when there are no hospital beds left over. So that's kind of the point of this quarantine, the scenario planning example. It's not, it shows us that it's not about reducing the extent of the spread. It's about um, being able to make sure that we can um, 
have a pandemic within the limited resources we have. Now we might find that our resources are way up here, in which case, heck, you know, no need to quarantine the hospitals to take care of it, which is kind of like where we are now, you know, because we have um, treatment options and things like that. And that's the reason um, why, you know, we don't aren't worried about it as much as we were like a year ago. All right, so that's kind of scenario planning example. Any questions about that? Questions online? All right, so I just wanna wrap up with to show you that there are other embellishments. SIR is super simple and there are a bunch of other types of diseases where we really do need to implement other types of compartments or get rid of them and so on and so forth. So SIR is kind of where we start is like the canonical disease. You could also imagine a disease where there's no recovered population, where everybody goes back to being susceptible. And, um, and so you're either either susceptible or infectious. And if we build a model like this, and so we can build a little differential equation of it, we can turn that into stocks and flows like down here, we can simulate that and we get different behavior over time where now we get um, this constant level of infected individuals and a constant level of susceptible individuals. So that kind of makes sense that there's no recovered population then there's always somebody sick. So that's a, you know, a kind of a difference there. We can add a period of recovery where after a certain amount of time, you become susceptible again. That's another thing that we could experiment with. We could add an exposed situation where um, you're not actually, this is kind of getting to the question of, are you showing symptoms? Um, so in this case, this person isn't necessarily infectious yet in the model, but they will be. So. Um, even though this group has escaped it, oh, there's gonna be an extra delay component because we've now got a group that will become infectious even though they might appear to be still in the susceptible group. And we can add the, the, the links in there as well. Um, and there's a ton more. If you go to the epidemic model page on Wikipedia or the compartmental models in epidemiology, compartmental models, see that term there, I didn't make that up. Um, you can you go to both of those pages there and they talk about all of these different types of models that all have letters, abbreviations or initialisms, just like I've been talking about. Some that get pretty complex, like the MSIR one, where um, you have an individual born with passive immunity from the mother. So things are getting far more complex. We actually have to model immunity inherited from a mother. And in all of these cases, um, on Wikipedia, they're gonna be written as these differential equation models. And this is why, even though we don't do calculus in this class, I want you to be able to translate this to a stock and flow, because this is sort of the lingua franca of system dynamics models are these differential equations. If you learn to translate these into stock and flow, then you can go to these pages and your, you know, your work is done for you. You just need to draw it out and then you can start uh, implementing it. So we shouldn't be afraid of this because it looks ugly. We can make it actually look better by implementing it as stocks and flows. So a lot of different ways to model epidemics. Um, it's kind of a nice um, uh, uh, quote here from John Holland, who's the pioneer of the genetic algorithm, uh, a very multidisciplinary person. Um, you know, model building is the art of selecting those aspects of a process that are relevant to the question being asked. So not every model, not every disease is an SIR, not every disease is an SEIR, and so on and so forth. You really have to ask what's really different about this disease and what model should we pick to match that? All right, so uh, that's kind of my concluding mark, uh, remark here. Tuesday, we're going to do lecture E4, which is going over Moorcroft's take on things. I think we're going to be talking about the bath model. Um, and so we're skipping four and five. So there's a reading exercise. Um, don't forget Sunday night, simple final project proposal. Um, you know, it's just about one to two pages. Tell me the project or the, the basic problem you've identified, the dynamic variables that you think will be important. Give me a simple causal loop diagram showing me how some of those variables uh, might influence each other. Um, just enough for me to see that you kind of know where you're going, you have a next step, and I can give you some feedback on that. And then, of course, a muddiest point. Uh, there's this assignment E2. Um, which is an exercise in the last two lectures, and that's due uh, this upcoming Sunday. So not uh, so a week from Sunday, basically. So about in a week and a half. All right. So um, 5:44. So let me give you the attendance exercise, and then I'm happy to take any lingering questions. Otherwise, uh, you can feel free to have a good weekend. So the question I have here is. Um,
what um hmm. um the well mixedness assumption is that the fraction of contacts with susceptibles is equal to the what so if i want to know um if i'm bumping in to an individual how many fractions of those interactions are actually with susceptible people what is that equivalent to by the well mixing this popular well, the well mixing this uh, assumption so if i assume a population is well mixed then i can assume that every time i bump into somebody the probability it's a susceptible person matches what and that's all i've got for you so if you have any questions feel free to ask otherwise have a good weekend and we'll see you tuesday for the moorcroft chapter All right, any other questions online? If not, I'll probably go ahead and end the meeting. All right, have a good weekend.